Oof. Sorry about that. By luck. Um, I was uh, studying to be a mechanical engineer back in the 80s, and I was studying also plastics engineering. <coughs> I, uh, I ended up uh, looking, I was looking for a job. I was working in an injection mold making company, machining injection molded piece parts um, m for molds. And I was looking for different work, and I decided that I was going to take a look at the Chicago Tribune, and I found a an ad that was about the size of a postage stamp, and it said, Mechanical Engineer Needed with a phone number underneath it. So I called the number. I talked to a gentleman named Bob Malvasio, and he uh, invited me in for an interview. So I drive to this company, and I'm sitting in the lobby waiting for somebody to come and get me, and I'm looking around the perimeter of the room, and there's pinball backlash just going all the way around the, the lobby. <clears throat> I'm like, this is a pinball company. I go, how cool is that? So I was offered a job as a hydraulics engineer, and then I was offered the job in pinball for $1,500 less a year, and I took the job in pinball because I knew it would be more fun. <laughs> <laughs> and it has been. It's been great. It's been a, it's been a, a glorious ride. Um, uh, I've had a lot of fun. Um, it's been a lot of work. A uh, lot of sacrifice, but uh, you know when I come to this and I see everybody happy and everybody's happy with the game that we made, um, it's all it makes it all worth it. It's awesome. So when I started to work for Premier Technology, uh, a game called Arena was on the line. It was designed by Ray Tanzer, and uh, I just recently had the pleasure of uh, I found a, an Arena brochure in a folder at home when I was digging some, through some things. I took it to work, and I had Ray Tanzer sign it for me the other day. Um, Ray Tanzer, uh, he uh, he put together the whole operation, uh, mapped out our new building, what was going to go where. Um, so Ray designed games. He ran engineering for a while, and now he is like a jack of all trades. He does all kinds of things. Um, Ray designed a lot of nice, you know, fun games in the in the '80s, and uh, you know, I learned from from Ray and John Norris and John Trudeau. And uh, so I started to work at uh, Premier Technology, and the first game that I started to work on was a game called Victory, which was a race rally game where you started the game and checkpoint one was lit, and you had to hurry up. You had to get to checkpoint one as fast as you could. And checkpoint two is next, checkpoint three, and you'd work your way through and try to finish the race as fast as you could and collect all the hurry-up points you could. And I thought it was really fun. John Norris wrote the rules for it. Um, after that, <coughs> I got to dig in a little deeper Victory was part of the way done when I started to work on it. Um, but I was making roll under gates, which uh, we actually don't, we try to use optos now. We're not using roll under gates so much anymore, but the old roll under gates had a wire form and a bracket just like they do today. But there was a spring that hung from the wire form that went down underneath the play field to a, to a leaf switch. So it was like, you know, you had to figure out all these different heights and stuff and tension on the spring and, uh, you know, and I was like, wow, why don't we use micro switches? You know, well, look at the ones that, you know, Williams is using micro switches, and I tried, tr tried to push that. Um, so, <coughs> um, so after I worked on Diamond Lady with John, John uh, Norris, um, uh, I worked on TX Sector with, uh, with John Trudeau, and that one I got to start from the, from the get go. So I, d I did the, the play field layout for that, <coughs> um, all, the, all the piece parts. I was the mechanical engineer at the time. I wasn't doing any designing yet. Um, so after that, there was a game <coughs> that came out called RoboWar. <coughs> and RoboWar, if you ever, do you all remember a game called Big House by Premier Technology? Well, it started out, uh, Big House was RoboWar. So if you look at the RoboWar backlash, you see this purple building in the background that's this really strange uh, it looks like an auger screw. It's this really strange uh, screw-looking shape, and that building is in the in the artwork <coughs> on the backlash. So when Ray Tanzer was working on what was supposed to be Robo War, they decided to change it to Big House. We put some searchlights in the game, and we made it a jailbreak game. So um, uh, later on, we saved the artwork for Robo War's backlash and cabinet, and John Trudeau made a game. Uh, Robo War, and if you look at that backlash, that that auger screw, that building is in the, is in the in the backlash. Um, Ray took a shaft 
and molded this auger screw. So what you did was you shot the ball, it went up around a lane, and it rested against the screw, and there were two wires next to it. And then as the screw rotated, it pushed the ball up to an upper level and dropped it into a ramp. Um, so that was that was a lot of fun to work on. Uh, that was a really fun game. And we all did the speech for the game, too, which was really interesting. Um, let's see, what do we have next? I have to put glasses on so I can see here. I used to pride myself on my vision, but uh, nowadays it's uh, cheaters are everywhere. <coughs> Let's see. <coughs> uh, game came out later in '88 called Bad Girls, um, followed by Excalibur. Big House was also in '89. Uh, then I worked on a game with John Norris called Hot Shots uh, in 1989, which had it had eight drop targets or eight targets on each side up the middle of the play field with a pop bumper in the middle. And you would complete all the targets and start a feature. And then you would, and then after you were finished with that feature, you'd complete all the targets again, start feature two, three, and four. Um, if you were able to get all eight drop targets down on one side and not hit any on the other side, the game gave you 10 credits. The knocker just started going bam, 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 bam. Very hard to do but it was possible and I had seen people actually achieve it. Uh, very difficult with a pop-upper in the middle, keeping those, you know, trying to keep the ball away from the opposite side. <coughs> Hot Shots was a lot of fun to play. Um, after that, Ray Tanzer did Bone Busters, which was in 1989. Um, uh, I believe, and I'm probably correct, um, Jeff Bush, who is an artist in the pinball industry, he did the artwork for that. Um, Connie Mitchell was our artist, but Connie farmed out some of his work to other artists uh, to do the, the packages for the art for the pinball games. Um, um, let's see here. Uh, Jeff did a beautiful job on Bone Busters. It was a really nice nice art package. And when the art package came in, one of the, the our technical illustrators, um, George Demarukas, looked at it and he goes, it's definitely, it's definitely uh, not Connie's work. I, Connie, we, you know, just doesn't look like Connie's art. So, um, uh, and then I found out later that Jeff Bush did it, and I worked with Jeff Bush at Stern Pinball and uh, or Sega Pinball at the time. Um, let's see, Lights, Camera, Action was a game that uh, that John Norris designed, and I actually got my first patent on that game for a mechanical feature that I made. And then after Lights, Camera, Action. I can't remember if there was anything else in 89, but after that we started making single level games with no ramps, which I was really upset about, but uh, the first one came out, it was a Trudeau game, it was called Silver Slugger, and it was really fun to score home runs and shoot those, sh those shots into those ejects with the spinners and, and, and collect home runs. It was really a fun game to play. Uh, Vegas came after that, then there was Deadly Weapon and Title Fight. Um, <clears throat> after that, I went over and I started working with uh, Joe Kamenko. Uh, Joe Balser had started working for Stern, um, and I talked to Joe, and I said, do you have any more room over there? And I sent a resume in, and Joe Kamenko read it, and he invited me in, and I actually got the job, but they didn't have anywhere to put me, so I got to sit in Joe's office. And I would listen to Joe talking on the phone to licensors and you know, he'd call up Hugh Hefner to say hi and stuff like that. You know, he, he just, he knew a lot of people. And it was really fun. It was very interesting to watch him work. Um, and then it was very stressful when he would have his, when he'd be sitting right here watching me draw. <laughs> and I, I knew he was there, but he didn't know I was there. And, um, the first thing that I was tasked to do when I started to work at Beta East was to make a dinosaur that ate balls. So I worked on this unit and I started to work on my first game after uh, after I had uh, got my first mechanical lead on the game Hook. Uh, Joe told me, he goes, I'm gonna let you try your hand. So I started designing this dinosaur game that threw pinballs, kind of like Frankenstein does, and then it went back and forth and it had a magnet way in the back of its mouth and it would bend over and it would eat the ball off the play field. The ball would get stuck on the magnet in the dinosaur's mouth. <coughs> um, and it would move and pivot it and pivot and drop the ball into a hole uh, where it would end up in a lock. So I worked on this game and I was just starting to work on the whitewood and build the game. And Joe comes in and he says, uh, 
Steven Spielberg is making a game called Jurassic Park. He goes, I would really like to do that game myself, so I want you to change your dinosaur game into Star Wars. And I was like, what? <laughs> so I just stopped, and, and uh, I, I used very little of the layout, the original layout in the Star Wars layout, but I, I replaced the dinosaur mechanism with the Death Star, and then I put a model of R2-D2 that jumped up and down, and its head moved back and forth, and the ball went underneath it. Uh, and fed it into the pop pumpers, and uh, that ended up being our biggest run of all time. It did probably about 500 units more than Lethal Weapon 3 did, and uh, that was my first game. So I was really stoked that I, you know, had a game that sold over 10,000 copies in a three-month period, and we did that in a 30,000 square, 30,000 square foot building. Um, we had a company that worked with us called Partech. They made all of our mechanical assemblies. And there were trucks coming into our dock all day long, just a load of this, a load of flippers, a load of pop pumpers. And there were trying to just make your way around to just go out into the factory to go look at a station or a mechanism that was being built was like, it was, you had to crawl over people practically. It was the, the place was, there were so many people working in there and there was just so much going on. We were making 200 games a day in a 30,000 square foot building. It was, it was ridiculous. Um, so let's see, we, so we started Data East, um, when I started at Data East, Simpsons was on the line, and then shortly thereafter I started to work on a game called Checkpoint, which we turned into a, a desert storm, we just made a one-off, we, we actually, uh, printed playfield art on a piece of paper, pasted it to a Checkpoint playfield that was a Whitewood, and made a desert storm game, so when you shot the ramp to see how fast you were going on Checkpoint, it told you how many miles per hour, in in uh, in Desert Storm, it told you how many sorties per hour you were, <laughs> how many sorties they were sending. So uh, uh, that was just a one-off, but that was kind of fun because Checkpoint was a really fun game. I really enjoyed playing that. Um, uh, I did a little mechanical engineering on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Batman, uh, following following Checkpoint. Uh, did a little bit of work on Star Trek, and then I got my first mechanical engineering lead on Hook, and I did that game with Tim Seckel. Um, we took the Hook license, actually, to get Jurassic Park, so it was a twofer, and they gave Hook to Timmy, and, uh, and we were probably selling three or 4,000 units of a game prior to that, and when Hook came, I think we did probably about seven, six or seven. It, it just exploded, and Dot Matrix was making a big, uh, you know, was was making its way into the industry and stuff like that. And everybody was, everybody was buying Dot Matrix games and, you know, to replace their outdated uh, alphanumeric games. Um, but Hook was a lot of fun. I actually went to a, to a show and Tim Seckel and I played against Gil Pollock, who was the president of uh, Premier Technology, and John Norris, the uh, Premier Game Designer. And Tim and I just just took it to him. We were, we were playing hook in the finals, and I was just on fire. I just was just going back and forth, shooting crack, clock lamp, uh, ramps, and, and just, and then Tim played really well, too, and we just, we, we beat, Nor John Norris is a really good pinball player. It's like playing Keith, um, and uh, so, you know, I thought, well, Timmy, we're going to get killed, and we, we were just both on fire, and we won the, won the tournament. Um, after hook, we did Lethal Weapon 3, I didn't have much to do with that because I was working on Data East Star Wars at the time. Um, when I made my first prototype, we uh, we took we we made the game, but we didn't have any of the molded parts in yet. So I took a piece of plastic and I formed it into a half circle to make R two D 2s body. And we the artist drew up a decal for me, and I just pasted it on. It was paper. Um, I went out and bought a, <coughs> a wiffle ball and I cut it in half to make R two D 2s head. And I took it up to the art department and let the, the dot matrix guys, uh, Kurt and, and Jack, they, they painted it up and they spray painted it silver and then they put the little blue windows in. And we took that game and put it together and we took it and put it in a rock and roll McDonald's in downtown Chicago and the game was at quarter play was earning $500 a week. It was just crushing. And the game was just, uh, we left it there for quite a while and it, it, it had wear on it by the time we went and picked it up. It was... A, um, and then we went into production with it. We were making 200 games a day, and uh, and then the market started to fall off a little bit after that. We, um, uh, following Star Wars, 
Uh, Tim Seckel and Norm Moores worked on Rocky and Bullwinkle together. Um, then Jurassic Park came in 93. Uh, Last Action Hero also came in 93 when we had a design for Last Action Hero and we ended up changing it a little bit. Uh, we changed the back glass like three times and the final version was a Arnold Schwarzenegger head about this big because they wanted it really large so they could see it, you could see it across a, you could see it across an arcade. <coughs> um, nobody really wanted to take, nobody wanted to be named as the designer of that game because so many people worked on it. Um, so we put Lyman Sheets' name as the as the game designer for <laughs> for for Last Action Hero. Um, Tales from the Crypt was my second game. Um, that was a lot of fun to work with. John Kassir was just great. He ad libbed. Uh, we sent him a speech script, and he ad libbed and just said all different kinds of crazy things uh, that we ended up using. Um, I still talk. I still talk to him this day. To this day, he was uh, he's a really nice guy. Um, he. Uh, he says, anytime we're ready to vault uh, Tales from the Crypt, he says he's, he's going to buy one. Um, after Tales from the Crypt, we did Tommy, and we did, the, we did Tommy with the, uh, the motorized mirror assembly, which was the same mech that we used on Tales from the Crypt for the big tombstone. Um, Tommy was very popular. Um, following that, I got my third game in, which was Guns N' Roses. I, uh, I had a lot of fun working on that game, Slash is a very personable, very, very nice guy. Um, uh, I, went to, I went to Slash's house in 93 after the big earthquake happened, and I walked into his house, and he, it, it, was, it was just pretty extravagant. <clears throat> a lot of big glass pane windows on the walls um, with, uh, it looked like a zoo, you know, he had, logs and plants and stuff in these things and you know he had a 25 foot boa constrictor in one of them you know he had a poisonous snake room that he said that he didn't go into very much and he had somebody come and take care of that for him and then all of a sudden i'm standing there in his living room and i'm looking at his games and he's got games spread around all over his house and uh, uh, uh his his pet um his name is curtis it's a six month old cougar just comes walking out into the room and i'm like holy moly, he's got a mountain lion for a pet. You know, I'm like, this is amazing. I'm like, oh, my God. So I was with Joe Camico, and we went to Slash's house. And after the earthquake, there were still, there were cracks in the walls. And um, it was, it was you know, there was a lot of damage that you could tell. But when that earthquake happened, a lot of that glass broke, and a lot of those snakes got free. And his wife was running around the house looking underneath furniture for her cats because she had, like, five or six cats. And I'm like, those are food. We get, get out of there. Get out of the house. You know, who knows what's what's gonna come crawling out. So Curtis, uh, he he took a shining to me, and he was rubbing up against me like a house cat. And uh, he was my best buddy for a while, and I was petting him, and I'm like, wow, I'm petting a mountain lion. This is totally awesome. So he laid down on the floor next to me, and he rolled over on his back, legs were out like this, like a dog, and I reached down and I started rubbing his belly. Don't ever rub a cougar's belly. Because uh, about a second or two later, this big paw that's about three times the size of my hand came up and just went, wha-bam, and it hit me in the head, and it knocked me over, and I fell on my back, and I was looking up, and when I looked up, Curtis was on top of me with his neck, or his, his, his mouth around my neck, and I thought, well, I just laid there. I didn't try to fight him or push him off or panic or anything. I just laid there, and I'm like, you know, good boy. <laughs> don't, don't eat me, and I figured it was either going to be over in a couple seconds, or I was going to live to tell the tale, so I'm glad I'm here to tell the tale. Um, Slash was awesome. Axel was kind of rough to work with. He showed up. I flew to California to record speech from them. Mike Klink, who was the producer of their, uh, of their music, he was going to handle the recording session. So Axel uh, went to the wrong recording session on the opposite side of town. He showed up a couple hours late. He arrived. He was angry. He was going to leave. Slash walked outside to talk to him and tried to, tried to you know, calm him down. He came back in. Uh, he went into the recording session, and he was going, jackpot, jackpot, jackpot. I'm like, you know, gosh, can we put a little more oomph on it? You're Axel Rose, you know. He goes, everybody get out. So they threw us all out. 
So it was just Mike and Axel in the room for about three hours. And when he finished, I think I got about four or five speech lines out of that whole recording session for the game. I was like horrified. I told Mike, I go, I have to take the DAT tape back with me to Chicago because we have to put it in the game as soon as we can. He says, well, I have to edit this tape. He goes, I can't let you take this. I can't let you take this tape. He was talking about all kinds of stuff. And so I had to wait a few hours. So now when I walk outside of this recording studio, I had a limousine that was going to pick me up and take me back to my hotel, but it was gone. <laughs> so I, I'm, it's, I'm, I'm out in the middle of California in L.A. Don't know how I'm going to get anywhere. Slash goes, oh, I'll give you a ride back to your hotel. So I went back to my hotel, and instead of taking a nap for about an hour and hopping on a plane a couple hours later, I just got in the taxi cab and went straight to the airport. I'm like, if I fall asleep, I'm never going to make that flight. <laughs> so we were up all night. Um, Guns N' Roses was a really fun project to work on. Uh, I really, really enjoyed working with that. And Slash came out to, uh, to Data East at the time, and, and he walked around all night. Um, we were working on a... We were working on Guns N' Roses, and we were also working on a video game at the time. And uh, and we were walking around, and Slash had a bottle of Jack Daniels, and he was passing it around to everybody. And so uh, programmer Neil Falconer ended up with that bottle. And when he left, when he left, um, when he left Data East, he gave me that bottle, so I have the DNA in case we ever need to clone a Slash. Bottle's empty though, unfortunately. Um, Maverick came in 94, and let's see, then we became, we became Sega Pinball, and I had the first, uh, I had the first game, the first Sega game, uh, which was Frankenstein in 95. Um, that was a lot of fun to work on, because I had that mechanism that I had designed for the dinosaur game that I thought was going to be my first game, so I used that in the, in the, uh, the Frankenstein game, so I made the character throw pinballs and uh, the original version, the unit turned back and forth, so I could, and it had a, a servo motor that ran the, that moved the head back and forth, so I could turn the whole mechanism, and then I could make the head look back this way, and then I could straighten them out, and I could make them look all over and make the body turn too, but we ended up taking the motorized portion of the, rotating the whole unit out, and we just left the head move and just let them throw the balls, and that's how that ended up. Uh, but that was a fun game to work on. I got to go to the movie premiere. I went with Paul Ferris. We went out to California. We went and had killer shrimp. If you're ever in California and you find a killer shrimp, go stop there and have a bowl of shrimp. It's delicious. Um, so we went to the we went to the movie premiere, and uh, I I was like I was uh, in the washroom, standing next to Danny DeVito, looking down. You know, I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't know. I didn't realize how short he was. Um, I bumped into a couple of people um, that were famous stars, and I was just like, you know, wow, this is awesome. I had, had such a good time. So Paul and I leave the, leave the show. Um, we, go back to the, we go back to the hotel, and we're going to go, and we're going we're gonna to go hop on a bus. And uh, we took our rental car back. We're going to hop on a bus back to the airport. We got there at the end of the night. So we're standing on one side of the building. The bus comes in. It goes around, and it goes back out. That was the last bus of the night. So we found a ride to the airport. We were late for our flight, and we slept on our travel bags in the airport overnight. That was fun. Paul, every time I see Paul, he goes, remember when we get stuck in, in the airport overnight? And I'm like, ah. Um, but that was, that, was a, that was a fun game to make. Um, uh, I never pictured Robert De Niro being, uh, being the, the creature, Frankenstein monster. Um, but uh, but it, was a, it was a good movie. It wasn't the feel-good movie of the year, but it was fun, and it was fun to do that game. Um, Batman Forever came after that. I did a little bit of work on that with Paul Leslie. That was Paul Leslie's first game design. Um, Paul later on left and went off to do work in the, the, the gaming industry. Um, then we did Baywatch in 95. And then uh, Joe Balser and I collaborated together and worked on Apollo 13. Um, Joe designed the playfield and I designed the rocket and the, and the, the moon with the magnet uh, that would block the ball. Um, so we both worked on that one together. That was a lot of fun. I enjoyed working on that game. I'm a space nut. I love NASA. Um, when I was a kid watching, uh, you know, Apollo 13 uh, come back, I was just glued, riveted to the TV. Um, and then Apollo 13, after we finished the game, we actually got to go and deliver a game to Jim Lovell's house. 
So we're on the way up there with the game. <clears throat> there was probably five or six of us. Uh, we took a bunch of back glasses for him to sign for us, and we carried the game into his basement and set it up for him. And while we were on the way up there, I was teasing the guys that he's got a bunch of moon dust in the basement, you know, and he's wearing his suit, and we get there, and he's jumping around because he never got to walk on the moon. Poor guy. Um, but he was really nice, really nice, really nice man. We en we enjoyed his company, and we showed him how to play the game and gave him all the tips so he could, he could uh, you know, so he would – he played the game, and he actually – wasn't a pinball player but he actually shot really well for you know being a first time <clears throat> but being a first time player he was not flipping both flippers at the same time he was actually you know he's coming to the right i'm hitting the right button um he played pretty well and uh a couple years later i knew a, a gal that did makeup for people that were uh in film and she got to work on him when he was doing a uh he was doing some kind of a uh, documentary or something like that and she got a Polaroid of him and he wrote on the Polaroid he says John I love this game I play it all the time and that was like five or six years after we made the game so that was a lot of fun to work on um, Goldeneye came shortly thereafter I didn't have much to do with that that was a Ward Pemberton game and then in 96 I made the game Twister um, I got to go to Oklahoma and I got to see some of the filming being done which was really cool they're driving down the street in a pickup truck with a great big fan in the back, and these people are throwing garbage and stuff and all kinds of debris into the fan, you know, and Bill and Helen are following in the pickup truck. Um, when I first got there, I met Bill, and Bill took us over to meet Helen Hunt, and he goes up and he walks and he bangs on her tra trailer door, and she goes, who is it? And he goes, it's me, Bill. The pinball guys are here. <laughs> and she came out. She was wearing curlers, getting ready for a set. Um, she was still very cute. Uh, even in curlers, um, but we met her briefly, but we walked around with Bill all day, and he recorded speech for, uh, he recorded speech for Twister, and he also recorded some speech for Apollo 13 for us on the same day, and we did it in a kindergarten classroom, and we were sitting on these chairs that were about this high off the ground. I guess when they filmed there, they took over this whole area, this whole town, and uh, so the school was theirs, and all the buildings were, were theirs to, you know, do with what they needed and store things in. And uh, It was very, very neat walking around those sets. I had a really good time doing that. Um, also in 96, I created Mini Viper, which was a small-scale cabinet and small-scale back box. Uh, didn't look anything like the production Viper did, but we made a one-off. I heard that game sold for like $20,000, and it ended up overseas, and it came back, and it kind of bounced around a little bit. Um, but we just made one uh, cute little game. It had a captive ball shifter in the middle, and it had a real Viper uh, cast iron uh, Viper car that uh, headlights lit up. And it was a cute little game. We took it to a show, and all of our distributors said, why didn't you make it a regular size game? So we, we ended up scrapping that, and, uh, and later on, uh, Rob Hurtado, um, made the, the production version of Viper. Um, Independence Day came in 96. Space Jam came in 96. I didn't have much to do with either of those. Uh, I was busy working on a game called Derby Days and Roach Racers, if any of you are familiar with those. Looks like a pinball machine. Uh, longer play field. Uh, no legs. Cabinet was looked like a pinball cabinet, but it went all the way down to the ground. And it was a redemption game. And what you did was you had two giant flippers on the bottom and a bunch of pop bumpers and targets. And you would play this game and try to advance your, depending on which game you're playing, advance your horse or your roach. Um, we named one of the roaches in the Roach Racers game Harry Gary. <laughs> and we made, it, we, we made this little roach, cartoon roach character and put Gary's hair on him. And it was just adorable. It was, it was really cool. Um, we made a couple of those, and we didn't go into production with those. And then I was also working on a, an old, uh, an old time uh, bowling game, um, like the old bowlers from like the you know the 50s. And uh, we themed it black light bowling, and we made this crazy looking alien creature that was the bowler. So the ball would come down, and it would feed over to a magnet, and then you could turn the guy left or right. And then the hand was up behind the ball, and the ball just sat on a little permanent magnet on this disc. And then when you hit the button, the hand would swat the ball, and it would go down, and it would knock the pins away. The pins were all stuck to the play field with magnets, but as soon as you broke the pin free, 
there was a counterweight behind that would pull down, it would pull the pin up and score a switch when it got all the way up to the top out of view. Um, we had black light, splattered black light paint all over the inside of the game and put a couple of big black lights on either side of it. Um, we made that and then we never, we never went into production with that game either. It was a lot of fun to make. Um, I wish I had one. Um, but it was, uh, it, it would take a while to play 10 frames on this game. So they were like, how are we going to price this? Are we going to let them play a quarter and let, let them play three frames? No, they're going to want to play a whole game. You know, it's going to take long. They were worried about how the game would earn, but, uh, we went to the trouble of making it and, and we, we took it to a couple of shows and, and they just decided that it just, w that wasn't in shipping it, that the game was huge and it was heavy. Um, but we, we didn't end up making that game, but it was a lot of fun to work on. And it was a, the, the mechanism for the, for the pin setter was, it was really, really cool. Um, that was a, a really good project. Um, 97, we came out with Trilogy, Star Wars Trilogy. And then in 97, after Trilogy, I did a little bit of work on Trilogy. I did the X-Wing that fired the ball. It's like a, like a ball cannon. Um, uh, 97, second half of the year, uh, I made uh, Jurassic Park Lost World. <laughs> Woo! I'm really surprised. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that, little, that little snagger. Um, when, I, when I read the script, they, they talked about this truck that's chasing this dinosaur down in a field, and it's running, and they're chasing after it, and it had this great big thing that came off the top of the truck, and, and it shocked the dinosaur so that they could then subdue it and, and, you know, and take it and cart it away. Um, and it sounded really cool when I read the script, but when they, they didn't film it very well, um, they showed it for like two seconds in the movie, and I was like, that's it? <laughs> I'm like, ah! Um, so, but uh, they wanted to do something besides putting a ball-eating dinosaur in that game. So I, so I came up with that mechanism for the snag. We called it, it was called the snagger in the movie. Um, that was a lot of fun to work on. Let's see, what else do we have here? Lost in Space came in 1988. Uh, Sharky Shootout came in 98. Um, Sharky Shootout was uh, originally designed game called Golden Q that John Norris designed and they ordered parts for maybe 500 games I believe at the time and then they decided that they didn't want to make it that way they wanted to revamp it and try to make it a little more uh, robust and and put a little more more features in it and I I thought okay so Gary comes up into my office and he's got this drop target bank with trip coils two gold ramps um, uh, uh, gold wire form ramps and he puts this pile of parts on my desk and he says make a game out of this <laughs> and I'm like ah so I took the the eight ball assembly on the golden Q game had a ramp that fed into it and then it would go through and there was a little paddle in there that would allow it to divert to the right side and I wanted to make it like a magic eight ball so I I had to take these original parts and I had to make fixtures to um, for production to modify these existing parts that we already had, and I added a motor to the bottom, and then I put a blue vacuum form ball inside the eight ball and put a little window in the eight ball so you could spin this thing inside and then light it up, and it would look like a magic eight ball was giving you a feature uh, or a point value or something like that. And that was kind of cool, and that was fun to work on. Um, the, uh, the game after Sharkies was Godzilla in 98. That was a Joe Balser game. Uh, South Park came in 99, and then I did Harley Davidson in 99. Um, and I believe Harley Davidson was originally a Data East game, and I think after we became Sega and we made it later, um, we had to rerun the backlash with the new logo on it. Um, let's see. Then we are now we are now Stern Pinball. Um, the first or the, fir or the first Stern Pinball game I did was Austin Powers in 2000. <coughs> Then I took a hiatus for seven years. I came back in 2007 to do the Indiana Jones license. Um, when I came back to Stern in 2007, they told me that they were bringing me back on a contract basis to do a Led Zeppelin pinball machine. So I was like, yeah, I'm on board for that. And when do I start? So I worked on it. I came in and I was, uh, I was a contractor at the time. 
And then after I was there for about two or three weeks, I was there every day. And uh, Ray Tanzer came up to me and says, hey, do you want to just be permanent? You know, and I said, sure. You know, so then they gave me permanent employment again. And, uh, uh, you know, so I, I, um, uh, I just, you know, kept, kept picking away and picking away. And uh, so Indi Indiana Jones came. Um, uh, Lonnie Rapp programmed with me. Um, that was a fun game to work on. I, I really loved the Ark of the Covenant, and, uh, and it, was, it was cool to load the balls into the Ark prematurely to the ball play and have, a, you know, and have an eight ball. It was an eight ball game. Um, so you put all your balls in the game, and when you fired up the game, the game would automatically load balls into the Ark, and then the remaining five balls in the trough were the ones that you played with until you opened up the Ark for multi-ball. Um, MBA came in 2009. MBA was originally intended to be a, uh, a game that we were going to just sell into China. Um, and so Ray and Gary were looking at it and trying to figure out what they wanted to do with it. They wanted to do a, a, a kind of a stripped-down version, an inexpensive version of Space Jam. So then they decided they were going to make it a production game, so I wanted to add some things to it. So I, I added a, an opening in the middle of the play field that the ball would fall into, and then I placed a kicker at an angle, so it fired the ball out of the hole at an angle, and it flew through the air, and I was able to catch it on a magnet on the backboard um, uh, where you made your baskets in the game. And I was like, okay, so I have this ramp here on the left that I can shoot baskets with, and I've got this hole in the middle, and I'm like, I wonder if I can do something in the orbit. And I, I put an up post in on the ramp, and it pushed up a piece of spring steel and gave the ball just enough momentum to get up near the basket where the magnet would attract it, and suck to the backboard, and it would drop it through the net. And I figured I got three ways to get to the basket now, and then we just finished the game, and, uh, and it, it turned out really nice. Um, it was, uh, and it didn't feel so much like a stripped-down version of Space Jam. It was just with the with the extra ways of getting the ball into the basket and stuff. It was really a lot of fun. Um, Big Buck Hunter came in 2010. Uh, I worked on Big Buck Hunter for quite a while. We we at that time we weren't molding as many toys. We we purchased toys for that game. So we found a a deer that was looking to to the right. And it was a very nice model. And then we found a better one looking to the left. And we're like, boy, I'd really rather use that one. So I actually took and flipped the whole game. I, I mirrored the whole game and made adjustments here and there to get this one particular plastic toy to work with the game so that as it was coming down the play field at an angle, it was looking at you instead of away from you. Um, that was a fun game to work on. I worked on that game for a long time, and that's when everything got pretty quiet over at Stern. You know, I'd walk in in the morning and I'd hear a screw gun go off every five minutes, you know, it's like, Trrr, and then silence. And then I would walk down the halls. Um, I would walk down the halls at work and I would, I would say, hello, and I would hear, hello, 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 hello. It, it was a pretty scary time. Um, I call it the dark days. Um, so in 2010, after Big Buck, we, we made Avatar, and that was when we made our first, what we called a premium game, which is like our LE today. Um, and I just introduced a couple of new features that weren't on the Pro to that. And we made 400, 400 premiums of Avatar, I believe. And we were at that number for a couple of models until we got a little braver and went up to 500. And you know, and today we're at 1,000 or 500. Um, so when, when I worked on the Avatar LE, I'm like, uh, I didn't want to change too much of the play field and make it a totally different game, but I wanted to introduce a white ball. So in order to be able to detect that white ball coming out of the trough, I put a couple of pieces of sheet metal where the ball rests on the shooter lane switch. So if a metal ball came out there, it landed on those two metal rails and it made a contact like a switch. But if the ceramic ball came out, it saw the shooter switch, but it didn't see the other switch, and I knew it was a ceramic ball. I needed to do a double scoring thing with that. Um, that's a game that I don't have in my collection that I would like, and if I was going to get one, I would definitely want to get the LE premium version of that game. Um, after that, that's when things started opening up, and we started bringing people back to Stern to work uh, when we did Tron in 2011. Um, I loved the movie. Um, I loved the game. 
um, I've been hearing a lot of people saying that we're, you know, we're going to vault that game, you know, or you should vault that game. Um, so I told everybody to just keep writing and uh, you write to Seth Davis at SternPinball.com. You know, we want Tron. Um, and then at the webinar yesterday, I heard a couple of people uh, clamoring uh, for a remake of uh, Walking Dead. So I'd, I'd really like to do that too. And that was also a SAM game that would have, there would be a lot of work to convert it over to Spike, but uh, I think it would be worth doing. Um, so we'll see what happens in the future. Uh, KISS I worked on in 2015, and at the same time we were working on, uh, Steve was working on Game of Thrones, and he'd been on it for about a year. I started on KISS in right around Christmas time that year, and... Uh, they came up to me and they told me that they were going to push Kiss in front of Game of Thrones. And I'm like, okay. Uh, it's January, February, March, April, we ordered parts for production. And in May, we were building Kiss in the new building on Lunt Avenue. Um, that was about the scariest thing I think I ever did because I was I had all these roto-molded parts out. And when you roto-mold parts, back in the day when we did it the way we did it then, we would make a, a mold and we would... Uh, make a make a casting of the piece part and it would be up about five or ten percent because when you go and make tooling off of that part it it, uh, it shrinks the, the it actually the, the, the part will actually shrink and then when you mold it and then the part comes out of the mold it shrinks a little bit so you have to kind of calculate the size of the part and the shrinkage I had bad dreams that that the ball was going to kick up and come out of Gene's mouth and it was going to get stuck like it wasn't going to wasn't the hole wasn't going to be big enough or it was going to shrink up too much and um, so all the all the molded parts for that that game came right at the end, and uh, that was pretty frightening. But it all went to plan. It all worked. Um, Seventeen, I I started to work on Aerosmith, which was the first game with the LCD. Uh, we pushed Batman. We pushed Batman in front of it um, because uh, we wanted to make sure um, we wanted to make sure that we could have the show before before he had passed away. Um, so we, we flip-flopped those two games, which was actually good for me because that gave us a lot more time to work on the, uh, on the new video, um, uh, the, the, new, the new videos for the game. The first LCD video I saw, uh, we did a, we did a version of Jackie talking, but we put, uh, the voice of Sparky from Metallica to it, you know, and just had like a little 20 or 30 second video, um. But that was really exciting. Uh, I love the LCD. There's, there, I can display so much more information and let you know where you are with different features in the game. Um, the graphics are unbelievable. Um, sorry. Um, and, uh, yeah, the graphics in the, in the game are beautiful, but it takes a whole lot of people to put all that content together. We have a lot of graphic artists now. Or when we were in Dot Matrix World, we had three guys that did the work. Um, so uh, Aerosmith was a lot of fun to work on. I wish we would have got speech from Steven Tyler. We had it scheduled, and he was coming into town to do a show, and he was going to record it, and he looked at the script, and he saw five or 600 lines that I had written, and he says, ah, I can't not. He wouldn't be able to do the concert after he did that, that speech session. So, And as we know, Steven Tyler is having issues with his voice, and Aerosmith could possibly be done. Um, that's another game that would be interesting to vault and go back and, uh, you know, and do some additions to. Um, 2017 also uh, was when Guardians of the Galaxy came. Um, I worked on that game for about three months before I even knew what the title was. And when I finally found out what the title was, I, uh, I had this play field drawn with the, the ramps on the right and the left and, and some, some mechanisms on it. And all of a sudden, I'm like, I find out it's Guardians of the Galaxy. I'm like, oh, it's beautiful. I have this big area in the middle that I left for some kind of a toy, and I'm like, that's where Groot's going to live. Um, at I was offered the Iron Maiden license at the time, and I'm not an Iron Maiden fan. I like them, but I'm not crazy about them. I, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy could have been Iron Maiden with a big Eddie in the middle, which would have been probably really cool. Um, but Keith... Keith took the uh, the Iron Maiden license and just crushed it. He did a great job. Um, that's a really fun game to play. Um, but I was a big Guardians fan. I really loved the first movie. I was, you know, and and the the model that we made for Groot was just gorgeous. Um, 
uh, when my model maker finished it and I went over to his house to look at it, I was like, wow, holy moly, the thing is gorgeous. Um, had a lot of fun working on that. Munsters came in 2019. I worked on that with uh, Dwight and uh, Elliot. Um, Elliot was the mechanical engineer on the game. He had just uh, designed his first game, John Wick. Um, Elliot is a young guy in his early 30s, uh, very talented. Um, so you'll be seeing a lot more coming from him in the future. He's he's very, very good engineer. Um, Elliot and Dwight and I also worked on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in 2020. And then, uh, and then I did Rush in 2022. Um, Rush is one of the games that I have in my basement that's next to my Metallica that's bolted to the floor forever. Um, I had to I had to have an LE. There was no substitute. I would I I could have taken a premium, but I I'm like I really really want an LE really bad because I just love the artwork, and uh, got to work with a new artist on that game, and and he did a really nice job with it. Um, I remember when I designed the I was des I was looking at uh, custom armor, and I did one with a a Rush logo, and I did a couple different ones, and I'm like, I'm going to make this thing look like a guitar. So I drew it out, and I'm like, these are going to be the open areas, and we'll put a little backdrop behind it with some art on it. Um, and I called it Guitarmer. And I remember when we got the first pieces in, I was holding it, and I was standing there like I was playing, and somebody shot a picture of me, and I, I saw it pop up online somewhere. Bored playing with the Guitarmer. Um, and then... Uh, and just recently, we just released the Metallica Remastered um, and uh, got a great response from everybody on that. Um, really, really super happy with the, with the, the outcome and the way the game looks. Um, in a couple months, I'll tell you the one thing that I took off it that was kind of cool. Uh, but we added a lot of stuff to that game and, and Sparky with the, with the UV. He's got UV screened on his chest. Uh, and we, we put UV ink in his eyes, his nostril cavities, and on his teeth. And when he lights up, um, and we're still working on light shows for that too, the bright light comes on, and then we're going to let the, the, the UV light, you know, kind of pulse on and off to make it look like he's glowing from within. Um, the, the Metallica logo that we added to the back panel looks really nice. And that way when you're playing, and, you know, I would play the game and I would shoot the ramps, and I knew I had a couple more letters to go to finish Metallica, but now I can just actually see it. I don't have to look up at the display to see where I'm at because when that ball comes around that ramp and I'm setting up for the next one, I don't have time to look up. So it was really nice to get that in there. Um, the hammer mechanism never had a key, or it never had a, uh, it never had a light associated with the ball uh, lock being lit. So I put a UV inside the hammer, and it casts light down on the play field, so I have a... I was talking with Greg about it, and I go, let's put a padlock and some chains going around the hole where the ball gets pulled down. And then I go, and then we can, we can UV screen a key next to it. So you don't see the key in the artwork. You just see it when it comes on. So you know your, your lock is lit. Um, added skulls to the, uh, to the slingshots. Did a lot of software changes. Added a couple of rules for the, uh, the two new albums that hadn't been... Uh, that weren't released when we made the game in 2013. So we incorporated inserts into the play field for those. Um, uh, we had a, you know, I, I, I thanked Jody today for getting James Hetfield to participate in our, in our trailer. Um, that was really awesome. Uh, I wasn't expecting it. I didn't even know that they had, that they had done that. Um, but that was a really fun game to work on and go back and work on something that was already fun. And, and just and just you know and pimp it out and just you know just add things to it and make it more fun. Um, there's a feature in the Metallica game that's not there yet. It's called Blackened. And so when you're playing the game and you get a multi ball, if you get Sparky, you collect James as the band member. And then when you shoot the snake and you start the snake multi ball, you'll collect Kirk. And when you get all four of the band members, the scoop lights on the right. I added more lights by the scoop lights blackened and when you shoot in there sparky comes into view with and you see the throw switch on the wall and he goes and he looks at the switch and he looks at you and then his eyes get all crazy like he's nuts and then he flips you the bird and then he throws the switch and then he looks back at the camera like this and then you see four silhouettes of the band members with the caps on their heads and they're all going Wah! 
So we get to, Sparky gets back at the band. He gets to shock the band. So that's going to be really fun. So uh, I was I looked at the display effect for that, and we have a, a new young graphic artist. His name is Patrick. And I walked by his desk, and I heard that he was working on that feature. So I was stood behind him, and I was watching it. And then, then he saw me watching, and he started it over, and I saw it from the get-go, and I was like, I was laughing so hard, I was crying. I was like, wow, this is awesome. And I go, but you got to give me a family, you got to give me a family mode for that. You know, you can't give him, the, you know, the bird has got to go away, you got to do this, you know. Um, so I really, en I really enjoyed, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was almost as much work recreating the new Metallica as it was the old one. And I think I spent about the same amount of time on it. Um, going back and keeping all the geometry as it was, a um, uh, lot of things changed. Like if you pull, uh, like the big orbit flat rail that goes around the back of the game, we, we don't put mounting feet on the radiuses anymore because it's hard to do. Uh, we've got different ways and different um, standards that we're using now. So I had to kind of make, I had to pull all the, the old stuff out and put all the new standards in. Um, there's a few of the rails and stuff in the game, uh, shot lanes and stuff that are that are ex ex exactly the same as the old game. Um, but there was a lot of work and uh, pulling all the GI in. The back panel on the game used to mount on the back of the playfield. Now it mounts on top of the playfield and acts as like a stiffener to keep the game from you know keep the playfield straight. Um, so I had to pull the ramps back both a half an inch, so they're a little shorter, but you can't even tell by looking at them. Um, and they still shoot exactly the same and feel the same. Um, I put chrome wire ramps on it. I was gonna put chrome wire ramps on the original game, but uh, the powder coating was a little more less, less expensive at the time, so this game's got chrome ramps. Um, it, was a, it was just, it was so much fun to work on on something, you know, and add to something that was already really, really good. I really enjoyed it a lot. So, and I'm sure you will all when you get a chance to play it. Uh, we're going to have a couple of them here on Saturday. So, it'll, we'll, they'll be here Saturday. And uh, we're bringing an Ellie and a premium. The line's going to be long. I put the posts up so we can try to get people through the line as quick as possible. Um, but it'll be here. And uh, it's, it's definitely a sight to see. There's a lot of stuff in the artwork to look at. And then the next game after that, can't tell you yet. <laughs> I think that's all I have. Yeah. <laughs>